if your company was a great place to work for, you would not have trouble hiring people, regardless of industry, regardless of tenure, regardless of any of those things, which means if you're saying, well, we can't pay enough. Okay, so then you have a wage issue, right? Which means you're not paying your workers enough. Hey everybody, welcome back to the How Did It Happen podcast. I'm so happy to have you here as I am every episode. Thank you for listening. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for sharing. I am fulfilling my promise to you today with another amazing guest, Stacy Gordon, joins me on the podcast. Stacy, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So excited um, to be here. Yeah. Thank you. So let me let me tell you a little bit about uh, Stacy and why you're going to be excited that she's here today. So Stacy Gordon is the founder, CEO, and chief diversity strategist at Rework Work. It's a great name for a company, by the way. Um, leading at the intersection of diversity, inclusion, and workplace culture, Stacy focuses on reworking the way companies work, including how they recruit hire and engage employees to effectively create inclusion and belonging for all. Stacy is the creator of the second highest viewed course at LinkedIn Learning, where she's reached more than 1 million unique learners. Her unconscious bias course has been featured by LinkedIn, Microsoft, and Alaska Airlines, and probably a bunch of others, because I looked at the website and there's a ton of high level names down there. So. It's also been translated into at least four languages, uh, which is kind of cool. That had to be kind of fun to see that. Yeah. Um, it is. So Stacy teaches in the business school at Pepperdine University, where she also earned her MBA. She's been recognized by Pepperdine as a top 40 over 40 leader by the Los Angeles Business Journal for her work in diversity and by Forbes as a top three business leader who spoke out about diversity and inclusion. Stacy is also the author of Unbiased, subtitle Addressing Unconscious Bias at Work. The book has been number one on several Amazon new release lists, and you can find her book on Amazon or wherever you buy your books. You can learn more about Stacy at her website, reworkwork.com, uh, LinkedIn at Stacy Gordon, and Maybe she'll share somewhere else to get in touch with her later. But anyway, Stacy, I start every show, same question, and that is, how did it happen for you? There's so many ways I can answer that question. <laughs> That's why I love the question, because you can take it anywhere you want. Yeah, I think, you know, I think I'd have to say it happened for me when I was recruiting, uh, because I used to you know, I, I, I really enjoy the idea about of recruiting, right? The idea that you can be a person that helps somebody find a job that they love um, and enjoy working. And I was helping, a, um, I wanted to say client, it's not the right word, but really it's candidate because my client, I was a third party recruiter. So my client is technically the company, right? Sure. But I was helping a candidate uh, with a, a position and it was just hoop after hoop after hoop that I had to jump through for this gentleman. And I realized, you know, after like third or the fourth hoop that it was because he was black <laughs> that I was having to do all this extra work. And I thought to myself, wow, if I was a different recruiter, if I cared more about my, um, my fee, I would have dumped him a long time ago and gotten somebody else who would be, they'd be much quicker to hire and I would have gotten paid faster. And this gentleman would be out of a job. And that's really what made me realize that, wow, I was doing the wrong thing because I was um, helping companies to find these diverse candidates, but I was also helping to put diverse candidates into workplaces that sucked. Hmm. Okay, that cuts right to it. <laughs> so that's kind of how I am. <laughs> okay, and that's cool. And that, um, so where did, well, first of all, I, the companies that were hiring you at the time, were they looking for diverse candidates? Because you kind of, it kind of seemed like you said that, but then they also presented challenges when you presented uh, diverse 
candidate? Where is that what you no. were specifically looking for? Or just they were just looking for someone to. They fill really were. They just wanted okay. a hire. But yeah. my, you know, in the way that I work, just innately, uh, that was what I was doing. Was I would find diverse candidates. I would give people the opportunity. I would get them in front of companies that maybe they wouldn't have gotten in front of before. Um, and I really enjoyed being able to do that work, but it was a fight all the time. Got and it. It, 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 I never noticed how much of a fight it was until that moment with that candidate. And what did you do about it? Well, I, you know, I kept fighting, right? I got him hired um, because that was one of the things I, I insisted. And um, I, I didn't, I don't know if I should have told him. I, I didn't tell him about all the back and forth that we had to do behind the scenes. Um, and, you know, he got a, a really great six-figure sales job, which he was more than qualified for, as the CEO of the company said that he was. Um, but what made me then pivot was I said, well, I have to be able to help companies to change their workplace culture. And they're not going to hear it from a, from a recruiter, right? They, they don't, that's not what they hired you for. They hired yeah. you to find them people. So um, that's really what started my journey on focusing in specifically on, on DEI and not just on the recruitment aspect. Okay. And before I, I'm, I'm going to go back to that, but first of all, I want to go I want to go pat the back to the past a little bit. So tell, tell me how your journey to become a recruiter um, started or came to be. Is it something you dreamed about as a little girl to become a, a, a recruiter or was it something that sort of happened along the way uh, or was it just an opportunity that presented itself at some point? You know, it's funny. I think it's just something I've always innately loved doing. Um, and so every job that I've ever had, I've managed to finagle my way into having something to say about the way they hire, okay. <laughs> whether they wanted me to <laughs> or not. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, and uh, that it, it really hit me because I didn't, you know, sometimes say hindsight's twenty twenty, and you think about things that happened in your past. Um, and I look back on one of the very first like, real jobs that I could have gotten, um, and it was working at a, a temp agency as their office manager and person that would you know handle just all the recruiters. And I ended up getting the job, but I ended up getting it too late. They called me maybe a week and a half after I had accepted a different job, and I always thought to myself like, "Wow, I probably it would." how would my life have been different had I taken that job? Instead, I didn't. I ended up working in a law firm, doing a bunch of other things. But in every job that I ever had, I've always been drawn to the way that companies recruit, how they hire, um, just that whole process. And um, I think part of it is just because I, I get bored really easily. And I love being able to look at all the different ways that people, like all the different jobs that are out there. People sit and think about all the jobs that people do, like how interesting that is. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, that's what's so great about being a recruiter or even working in a temp agency that you have no idea as a normal person, all of the different jobs that are, that are out there that people do and all of the different things that people do. It's a, I worked in, we, we provided um, waste services to manufacturers and I got to get inside a lot of plants and I got to see people doing all these different kinds of things um, that I never I mean, people couldn't imagine what we were doing, but I couldn't imagine what, what all these different jobs that people were doing. It was, it was just really fascinating to me. Sorry to go off on that tangent, but, um, but yeah. That's great. I mean, that's, that's, I think is, I think it's something we should all have to do, right? We should, you know, instead of having like a doctor or a police officer come in for like career day <laughs> at yeah. schools, they should take kids and take them out to a factory, take them out to a plant, take them out to a car dealership, you know, let them see people actually working, what that looks like. I agree. And um, we actually did have a program in Milwaukee where we did that. We took kids that were in eighth grade and we took them into manufacturing facilities to show them all the different jobs, not just on the floor, but, you know, all the office jobs, the sales jobs, the CEO jobs. And it was funny because the kids are always very interested in what the CEO makes. And that was always a question that came up. It was never answered, but it always came up. So it was, uh, yeah, it was very interesting. So um, when you were, you know, had this, I don't know if epiphany is or realization when you were working this with this fellow, um, did that 
how long did that take to manifest itself into you, you know, starting a business to address this? Because that's a big step. Yeah, you know, um, and, and it's a little fuzzy for me, right? But I was working, I was running my own recruiting agency at the time. Oh, okay. And um, what I wanted to do was focus in on um, specifically diversity recruitment. So I, you know, I talked to a lot of different companies. I had all these contacts and none of them um, really wanted to be able to bring me in as a diversity person because they said, oh, you just did recruiting, right? You can't really be like a, a diversity manager. And um, I just kept searching and I eventually got hired on uh, with a, a large bank and I, I went in specifically to go work for a company so I could see how they managed um, diversity in the workplace. Um, because I, I just thought from what I can see from the outside, it doesn't look good. <laughs> so I was like, I wanna see what they're doing internally that is so different because they've gotta be doing something, right? They're spending all this money on diversity initiatives and they're starting to hire chief diversity officers. And what I found was, um, it really was, you know, no different. There wasn't much happening. There was just money being shuffled around. Um, and it, it really made me realize that I could do it as a consultant and not be, um, not, not have an issue with it. Right? It wouldn't be like, oh, you have to have worked at, you know, Apple and Facebook and all these other places before you could do it. Yeah, I see. So you basically, you just change the label and because you already had the skill set and you already knew what you, how you wanted to change things or how you wanted to help people change things, but because you were a recruiter or whatever, they were just like, no, you're, they would basically define you as that right. as opposed to, so you change the label and all of a sudden people are like, what'd you say, Stacy? What do we have to do? <laughs> it really is. It's so interesting. I mean, and that's just, it's human nature. And that's what we're literally fighting against, right? In trying yeah. to change in companies is, stop taking people and putting them into these boxes and expecting them to stay there. Because first of all, the box you put them in isn't even the right label to begin with. Mm. Uh, so, you know, we spend so much of our time fighting against first impressions, fighting against the stereotypes that people label us with. And a lot of the time we don't even realize that we're doing, that we're having to do that. You know, we can't figure out like, why is it so hard for me to get promoted in this job? Well, because Bob, when he first saw you, thought that you belonged in maintenance instead of in marketing. Mm. <laughs> and so now you have to spend all this time trying to maneuver your way through corporate BS to get where you should have been in the first place. Right. Okay. And what, so when you were in the bank um, and you saw that, you know, it wasn't, there was, you said money being passed around, but it wasn't actually working. What? What did you conclude from that? What were the reasons that, you know, if someone's going to make an, a company's going to make an investment, for example, and make the hires you, that you said they, they, they did bring you in, what, what's the, what's prevent it? What, why doesn't it happen? I guess. Cause I, I don't there? think, I, I don't think that there was, I think the focus has shifted. So in fairness, right. To, to this company and, and to companies at that time, in the last 10 years, the understanding of diversity and inclusion, because that's what it was back then, right? It was just diversity or diversity and inclusion. Now we're talking diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, justice, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I think the idea back then was really that if we can help these associations and these groups that are focused on black people and women and LGBTQ professionals and the disabled, right? You know, individuals with, with disabilities. If we can just help them, then they'll help themselves. <laughs> but it's still, you know, we've realized that that's not the case because it's like me working as a recruiter, trying to help these individuals get hired. I can help them get hired, but then what, right? The company structure is still the same. The company structure hasn't changed. So what companies were doing was a lot of external, right? Here's a check go fix it external and say, no, you know, physician heal thyself. You need to look inside because the problem is actually you, not them. 
Okay, I get it. So <clears throat> we'll write a check and you fix this problem for us and come back, tell me when it's all good, that kind of thing instead of, exactly. yeah, okay. You mentioned the law, working for the law firm, and I, I wanted to ask you, and I forgot that I saw that you went, you spent some time at Fordham Law School, and I wanted to, you're not a lawyer, I don't think, but you were, you were you intending to be, I'm always fascinated by people who have their MBA and are also <laughs> lawyers and, you know, that kind of thing. So I thought, yes. I can't, I can't just leave that go. Well, you know, it's a, it's a, I was going to say it's an interesting story, but maybe some people won't find it that interesting. <laughs> but <laughs> it's one of those things, and I think this is why I am such a I'm so interested in careers and career trajectories and what people do and how they get there and the advice that you get or don't get. Um, because when I was a kid, I said I wanted to be a, a judge. That was what I said I wanted to be. Um, not realizing that in order to be a judge, in most cases, you have to kind of go to law school for it to become a lawyer and do all of these things, right? I didn't understand that process until I really had gotten into maybe college. And it was like, wait, what? I've got to do what first? <laughs> so it totally changed what I wanted to do because I had no intention of becoming a lawyer, did not want to be a lawyer. Okay. The only reason I wanted to be a judge was because I wanted to change injustice, right? I hated the way sentences were being handed down. I hated the way that, again, people were being um, uh, unfairly, you know, um, charged with crimes, unfairly searched, unfairly imprisoned, right? All of these things. And I thought, well, if I'm a judge, I can fix that. Well, as I got older, I realized, well, no, you can't because you have to follow these rules. And the judge, most of the time, doesn't actually have any leeway over the rules, especially if you've got these three strikes types, you know, Sure. Uh, yeah. And so Mandatory. when I realized that, I was like, oh, I don't want to be a judge. But then I was like, well, I've spent all this time thinking to myself, well, I have to go to law school. So now what do I do? So I went to law school because I didn't know what else to do. <laughs> but in all the work and all the things I've talked about with people, I kept talking about how much I wanted to run a business. I've always wanted to run my own business. And it's just interesting that nobody ever said, well, Stacey, maybe you might want to go to business school instead of law school. Like nowhere did anyone say this. And this is also part of this idea that we get into these silos and we get very myopic, right? About what we can and can't do because my world, I worked as a paralegal for many, many years. So my world was filled with lawyers, right? That's sure. all they know. So when I said, this is what I'm looking to do, they were like, yeah, go to law school. That's great, go to law school. Had I been surrounded by different people they probably would have said, don't go to law school. That's stupid. Go to business school, right? Or don't spend money on a graduate degree at all, right? I would have gotten different advice. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but that's, the, I think, why it's so important that we look at who are we surrounding ourselves with? Because the information and the perspectives and the vision that we have is molded by the community that you happen to be in. And if you're stuck in one type of community, that's all you're going to see and that's all you know. Yeah. And you have no idea that there's these other things happening on the other side. Makes that makes total sense. Did you grow? I know. Did you grow up in in the Northeast? I noticed that Fordham was. You went to Fordham. I don't know if that was. Um, bef you know, you're in LA now. I think. Um, yes. So I did, yeah. So. Yeah. So I, you know, trajectory. I ended up in LA. I've actually now lived in LA longer than I've lived anywhere else on the planet, and. That bothers me um, because <laughs> Why? I, well, for the longest while, I don't know if I do today, but I would say even as 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 uh, recently as, as a few years ago, I still considered myself a New Yorker. Um, and so I just I don't vibe with the Los Angeles way of doing things. Um, as you said, I'm, I'm very much upfront. I tell it like it is. You don't get that a lot out here in, in Los Angeles. That's very much a New York <laughs> way of doing things. Um, and I miss it. I miss transparency. I miss authenticity. I, I miss just, just tell me the thing and let's be done with it instead of all this back and forth nonsense, you know? So I actually went to uh, junior high and high school in New York and then moved out here um, right around the time that I dropped out of law school. <laughs> so, uh, but I was actually born in London. So 
Oh, you I are. spent okay. first 12 years of my life or so in, in London, another 10 or so in New York, and then the rest out here. And did that's that's great. Um, wow, that's cool. Did, did you did you move here because your parents um, had a job transfer, or did what what brought you to the states? Um, no, my my parents just. Um, I don't know the entire thing, but I always remember my parents talking about Maggie Thatcher and the Dole. Okay. <laughs> so, and my my mom had a lot of family, like all her family is here in in the states. So. Okay. And also, I haven't spent much time in LA, but it's interesting what you say about the difference in um, approach, I guess, is what you were saying, the way people approach things. So I think what if I was reading you right, you were basically saying that uh, maybe in New York, you know where you stand with someone quicker and more accurately, perhaps, than maybe the way that people, a lot of people in, in LA maybe choose to for sure, and it's yeah, a, it is a okay. different approach. I think people out here have a, a and I'm, I'm being totally stereotypical. I know, um, <laughs> but from what I've observed, <laughs> why not? <laughs> and from what I've experienced, right? I think that people in Los Angeles have a uh, less of a tolerance. They they don't like to like hurt anyone's feelings. They'd much rather put you off and say, yeah, sure, I'll get to it. I'll look at it. I'll talk to you. I'll whatever, right? rather than just say, no, I'm, I'm not interested. That's not for me. It's not my cup of tea. I don't want it, <laughs> right? They just, and, and it's just a different, uh, different approach. And so um, I think for me, I, I've had to temper my own uh, brashness, so to speak, because <laughs> I will tell you like it is in a heartbeat. Um, and I've realized that that is a quick way to make people cry in Los Angeles, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you don't need to be passing out tissues all day long, right? It's like, <laughs> okay, so you started, uh, you, you kind of relabeled yourself, started as a consultant. When did, when did Rework Work actually get off the ground itself? Was that, did it start as you, just you and your, your, your consultancy, or was it a transition or a transformation from that to what you have now? Yeah, it really was a transformation. Um, you know, as I said, I started off as the Gordon Group, um, and it was just me. And uh, in 2016, uh, changed the name to Rework Work, and it really was just out of that frustration of um, wanting to see change and realizing that we needed to rework everything about work. Um, and that's how I came up with the name. And I was I was so shocked at the time. I was like, no one's using this. This is cool. yeah. That URL was available. That was really good. Yeah. And, when, and so, I don't know, how did you, I guess, I guess, first off, how, how did you target your first clients? And what was, the, what was the message that got you in the door? Because um, you mentioned the, 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 your experience with the bank, and I'm wondering, okay, where was your, where your, did you have experiences like that when you came in as rework work where people would be like, oh yeah, we got to, yeah, we got to do that. It's one of our, you know, whatever. And then you come in and it would be or hard, or was it just tough to get indoors? Um, it's usually tough to get indoors. I think what got me okay. in the door was I do a lot of speaking. Um, and so I would be at a lot of conferences, uh, you know, in the conference, I would speak at it. And what I find is that again, because I'm pretty transparent, I tell it like it is, some people do like that, um, which is why I realized that I've, I've almost sort of cultivated my own client list based upon who can deal with me and who can't, right? The people who don't want to hear it, who aren't ready to hear their truth, they're not seeking me out anytime soon <laughs> because this is just, you know, how it is. And in fact, I was at the Sherm Talent uh, Conference uh, in August of this year. And uh, a woman came up to me afterwards and said, you know, Stacey, I have got to tell you, I loved your session. She's like, I've gone to so many conferences. And this is the first time that somebody on stage just said, tell the damn truth. <laughs> and I was like, yes, like, I don't understand why you haven't gotten that message before. But if you haven't, glad you got it today, because it's what we need to do. Um, we need to be transparent about what is going on in our workplaces because you can't fix what you can't face. Yeah. 
No, you definitely can't fix what you can't face. And you can't, uh, you, you, you can't fix a problem until you admit you have a problem or an issue or whatever you want to call it, right? Well, so um, the, well, I guess let's talk about how you actually fix, help companies fix things. So I'm wondering, I think, and I, I mean, I've owned a couple of companies, Stacy, so I, I have some experience here. Maybe I've, maybe I've had a total of like 220 or 230 people uh, working with us. And there was never a time that I felt like I was intentionally not, you know, trying to hire the best workforce that I could and treat people the best way that I could. But um, that, that usually most of the time manifested itself in not a ton of, uh, you know, what people would consider diversity. So I feel like at the inclusion part, <laughs> or part of the inclusion part I was able to get, but the diversity part, probably not. And I'm wondering how most companies feel when they bring you in. Like, how do they, do they feel like, I'm sure they don't feel like they suck, like the companies that you said, then <laughs> they probably do, maybe they do, but how do they feel? And how do you talk them through the initial sort of discussion? Yeah, they, they don't feel it, right? And so this is where I do point the, these things out. And I'll be honest, right? If I'm sitting with, with a client, I'm not going to tell them they suck. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll put it in nicer words. Um, but, you know, <laughs> I, I think that's where I enjoy being able to, to be on a podcast or be able to, you know, speak at a conference because I can say, you suck, right? Like I could say that. Um, yeah. And then whether or not it's actually true, right? You've got to answer that question. You have to really ask yourself that. And so I think part of it is um, right now, everyone is complaining, right? About um, the great resignation. Yes. So everyone is leaving their jobs. And even that alone, if you, those three words, the great resignation, it implies, it has this tinge of how dare you, worker B, leave my company, right? <laughs> It, it's not complimentary to yeah. the employees. It's this, this insidious kind of, you know, uh, negative thing. And so you've got to ask yourself, if you right now are having trouble hiring, there's a reason. Because you know who isn't having trouble hiring? Netflix. You know who isn't having trouble hiring? Google. And it's not because they're big companies, right? It's because they have done certain things that are needed to make themselves a desired place to work. So facts are facts. Either people want to work for you or they don't. And if you have a problem hiring right now, it's because there is something inherently wrong with your company, right? And that's, I mean, I can't, you, people are going to want to say, well, no, that's not true. And but let's bring it down to brass tacks and let's be real about it, right? If your company was a great place to work for, you would not have trouble hiring people, regardless of industry, regardless of tenure, regardless of any of those things, which means if you're saying, well, we, we, we can't pay enough. Okay, so then you have a wage issue, right? Which means you're not paying your workers enough. Now, granted, you might not be set up in a way to be able to pay at the highest rates, but again, that's something you then have to compensate for. What are you willing to compensate with, right? What are you willing to offer in lieu of wages? What type of flexibility are you willing to give? What type of environment are you offering? You can't be a workplace that pays people poorly and treats them poorly. Right, bad combination. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you can't have both. So, and you want to aspire to a, a, be a company that pays people what the job is worth, not what the job will accept, right? What the job is worth to the company. So that means regardless of where people are, because now we're hearing people say, well, I can hire from anywhere. I'm going to hire from a, a, a lower um, geographic region, right? A place that has a, a lower cost of living so I can pay them less. No, no. You pay them what the job is worth to your company, regardless of where they work, right? That's what makes you an employer of choice. That shows that you actually give a crap about your employees. 
Yeah. And that you value the contribution they are making to your company. That was really interesting what you said about the great resignation. I hadn't thought about it that way. Um, you, but I, but I, as you were explaining it, I thought to myself, oh, yeah, okay. So how many people do I run into who, you know, blame why they can't find people on millennials work ethic, for example, or they, they, they have all kinds of reasons why they're not able to get the people they want or the people they need. Um, but I, I hardly hear anybody say, you know what? It's my fault. It's my fault that I'm not able to get the right people here. It's my fault that I, you know, we have all these people leaving. It's my fault that, you know, we can't attract the talent we need at Sky. So I'm glad you you said that because I didn't I didn't think of the great resignation as that, but it kind of it kind of is. It's kind of that same exact thing. Right. There's no ownership, right? It's constant again, it's it's outside, right? It's back to what I said earlier about looking externally. You want to blame everything else under the sun other than the actual, uh, rather than lay the blame where it needs to go, right? Which is right. on your own practices, policies, and procedures. Yeah, because, and it's, you know, oh, go ahead. Well, no, I was just gonna, you know, just reiterate the point that, it, you know, if you look at your competitors, there are competitors in your industry that aren't struggling. Right. And I think what I heard you say too, is that like, your work is not just about uh, helping people attract you know, uh, more diverse uh, ethnicities to their to their business. It's about really looking at the whole business of what you know, what brings people here, what keeps them here, what makes them go away. It's a lot more than just making you know these the, the right th these certain types of hires. It's a so you take more, like a holistic approach to this to help them really yeah. understand. Okay. Yeah, definitely, because it, it's not about hiring, you know, three black people and two gays right, yeah. and, and one person in a wheelchair, right? Like that's not what the, <laughs> yeah, I, that's not what we're doing. We're not going grocery shopping, right? For dimensions of diversity. Um, but it's also understanding that if women, for example, in your company are having a really hard time getting promoted, the interesting part of that is that it's not just the women. There are also men who are having a hard time getting promoted. So if you fix it for the women, you will also fix it for the men, right? Uh -huh. So once you start looking at these, um, uh, th these different policies, these different practices in the company, I mean, when you fix it one time, you fix it for everyone. You know, when we do these assessments and we, we do um, employee surveys and we ask, uh, what is it like to work here? Yeah, you might get 80% of women who say, it's really hard. I'm getting sexually harassed. I'm being bullied, right? I'm dealing with all of these issues. But what's also interesting is you will see 50% of men say the same thing. Oh yeah, really? Okay. So fix it, period, right? It's not about fixing it for women or fixing it for men. It's just fix it. For the love of God, fix it. <laughs> How many, if, so you mentioned Netflix and Google and, and there, there's, you know, others, you said, compare yourself to, to the leaders and, you know, you could see kind of where you are versus where, where they are, but how many, in your experience, um, how many companies, percentage of companies are sort of getting it right these days versus ones that still have like a long way to, a long way to go? Yeah, it's a, it's a hard question to answer. And I would, you know, it's also sad to say, not that many, um, because, and I, so I struggle with this because I don't want to say that this work is hard. And, you know, I talk to my team and they're like, yeah, but Stacey, the work is hard, right? This is what makes it difficult. And I'm like, no, it's not so much that the work is hard. It's that we are so stuck in our ways of doing things a certain way that what is hard is actually just changing uh, or even being open to change. The work itself, the things we need to do are not difficult because when I say that the work is ongoing, right? What people hear is, ugh, the work is ongoing. It never ends. It's so laborious. It's right. so difficult, but it's work. So 
what job have you ever been in where you have a sales goal and we say, we want to uh, sell a thousand widgets and you sell a thousand widgets and you ring the bell and go, great job. We, we sold a thousand widgets. Let's all close up shop and go home. Right. 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 Or we reach that it, goal. So next year, I'm only going to ask you for 900. Right. <laughs> like it's on, it's yeah. always ongoing. Everything we do in work is ongoing. So I don't know why when we come to diversity, equity, and inclusion, we somehow make it seem like it's this arduous extra thing that is so hard. No, it's just the same of everything else that we do in the workplace. So it's really about a perspective shift. Yeah, okay. And this organization that you're certified through, I, I, I know you said it's SHRM. I had it. Is that right? S-H-R-M. I, I, it's, I yeah, it's SHRM. It's the Society Sherm. for Human Resource Management. Yeah, SHRM. I, I, I was thinking to myself, there's got to be, sorry, but there's got to be a better acronym because even the words don't, anyway. I don't know where the H comes from, but um, <laughs> what t can you tell me more about that? Because I'm not familiar with it, but it sounds like a big deal. Yeah, so um, the, so, yeah, the Society for Human Resource Management is, um, I was going to say probably, but I believe it is the largest human resource um, association in the world. Um, and so they have, um, anyone who's in HR knows Sherm. So they are um, either members or they're certified or they're attending events or I don't know what they're doing, but they're, they're, they're noticing Sherm. Um, and so they have, um, I don't even know, I, I don't know how many chapters, but they've got tons uh, around the, the country and I said even around the world. And their goal really is, is to provide resources for human resource professionals uh, in companies. So they do a lot of conferences and um, they also offer uh, certifications um, in inclusive workplace culture, which I have, and then also the SHRM um, senior, senior certified professional certification. So <laughs> Everything's a mouthful with that organization. It is, it is such a mouthful. <laughs> and it's really just, I mean, you it's, learning and looking at um, what it is, what it takes, right, to run a company. Um, and just looking at all the different uh, functions and seeing where HR is embedded in there. Because a lot of times people think about HR, they just think they're the person that does your, you know, your benefits. And if you get in trouble, right, their, their compliance are gonna come tell you what you did wrong. Um, and that's pretty much it. But really, HR, you know, they're managing the human capital, right? The biggest yeah. resource that a company has are its humans. And it is HR's job to not only manage that, but to advise the senior leaders and ensure that they are not a liability to the company. Um, and that's always one of my big things. I say, look, you all know a, an in individual in your company right now, a manager who you would not want to work with, right? And yet that person is still in your company. Why? They're out they're, here willy nilly yeah. doing things. And they're things. still in charge of other people. And you, <laughs> right. you think, ah, oh, I wouldn't want to work for that person, but I'm, but I'm still putting people in front of that person to work with right. and expecting exactly. a different result. Yeah. And then when a lawsuit, you know, people say, oh yeah, I knew it was only a matter of time before he did something. Yeah. Why is he still there? Right. <laughs> so you, when you take an engagement, do you, would you, will you take engagements where you're only working with HR, Stacey, or do you require, you know, the whole you know, sort of the, from the, the CEO president to be involved when you, when you come in and, and, and I'm, well, I'll, I'll wait to your answer before I tell you why I'm asking the question. Cause you'll probably say why. Um, you know, it depends. I used to be a stickler and I would say, I'm not coming in and just doing a one workshop. But what I realized is that you have to meet people where they are. And some people, they are not ready for the whole kit and caboodle. Um, they are barely ready. Uh, and I'll use the example of a prospective client that I spoke to who wanted me to come in and, and do a lot of education for all of their employees um, around 
unconscious bias. And I said, okay, well, that's fine. And I went through some of the things that we talked about, but because they were a, uh, a Christian organization, I knew there was gonna be an issue with LGBTQ, right? So I specifically asked and I said, and what is your stance, right? On LGBTQ professionals in the workplace. And it was kind of, it was a, <laughs> kind of funny because you could tell she had not thought about it. And she literally stopped and said, oh, well, can't you just skip that? <laughs> and I was like, okay. no, no, I no, I cannot. That. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and so, we may you need know, the tissues here, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> right. So, you know, I realized in that moment that this, these individuals, they're going to need a lot more education. Yes, we might do an unconscious bias session for them. And then we're gonna to need to do a second and a third and a fourth, right? And we do these ongoing and we keep introducing concepts. Um, and then, but that's an organization where we would need to have a conversation with their leaders. We would need to know what are your values? What do you stand for? What are you willing to accept and not accept? Because if we're gonna be doing these education sessions, um, you know, I don't want you telling me, oh, you can't talk about this particular thing. And it's like, mm. In order for me to do my job, we have to talk about that. So do you right. want me to do my job or not, right? So it's just having those conversations and realizing that some people can't do the whole big thing right now. They just need, some of them just need a real session where we can sit down and start talking about, do you understand what diversity, equity, and inclusion is? Let's have a conversation about that. And that alone is enough for some people. Like that's gonna last them a few months. Like that's gonna blow their minds and they have to go away and think about it. <laughs> so. But in other instances, we do, we prefer to start with an assessment. We'd like to do a organization wide survey that goes out to the entire company. And so that we can get feedback from everyone. And that way uh, we're able to get data and we'll have companies say, well, you can just take our data. We did a survey already. I don't want your data. I mean, I do want your data, but I don't want it in this way because you are a company where in many cases, people don't trust you. So when they answered your survey, they didn't answer honestly, or they chose not to answer at all. So not only do we have missing information, but we have incomplete or inaccurate information. But when we come in and do a survey, they know it's external. So they're, they're honest and boy, are they honest. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point because you, um, oftentimes when you do a survey, um, the people who are happy opt in and the people who are unhappy opt out. And so you get your results back and you're like, you can delude yourself, right? Like, wow, look at how great exactly. we are. Yeah, we only had 37% participation, but I can't make people do it. You know, that kind of, it's just a, yeah, okay. I thought, um, I, don't, I don't know if I asked the right question before, so I'll go back at it. The, I think it was an unfair question to ask you like, what percentage of companies, you know, in your experience or get it versus don't, I guess what I'm, as I was thinking more, the, this, this difference between conscious and unconscious bias, um, how, maybe that's a better question because I, I wonder to my, myself, like I gave you my own experience. I don't, you know, I, I unconscious bias by, by its nature is something you're not, you may not be aware of. It's just, sort of hiding right in front of you. Um, but conscious bias is intentional. At least that's how I hear it. So how I'm curious how often you run you get into a situation with a company and they're there. It's, it's about way more than unconscious bias. And what do you do about it? Honestly, we haven't had to deal with that too much because oh, okay. as you said, when you are dealing with conscious bias, you're talking discrimination, right? Yeah. You're talking actionable lawsuits. So um, the, the times that it has come up for us, I immediately refer them to an attorney. <laughs> I have a, um, as soon as you a, see a, it. Yeah. yeah, I have a couple of friends and I say, listen, you need to talk to this company. That is not what we do. And I'm not trying to repair your reputation when you were in the middle of, you know, because what they'll say is, well, can you come in and do unconscious bias education? Um, because we've got this issue going on. No, you need to fix the issue. That's a huge issue. And me coming in and doing this isn't gonna smooth it over for you, right? right? 
you have to actually take care of that. Um, and then once that's taken care of, we can, we can do some additional work. How did you decide to write your book? Um, and what was the process like for you? Um, I'm always interested in, in the author's journey. Uh, yeah. Um, gosh, I decided to write the book. I had wanted to write one for quite a while and I had been looking for a publisher, um, but I refused, you know, I'm all about efficiency. <laughs> and I was like, I don't want to write the book until I have a publisher because then I'll spend all this time with this work sitting here and I won't do anything with it. Mm. So I did find a publisher. Um, and so then I got to writing and I basically spent, uh, what year are we in? I guess it was 2019 writing because it published in 20. No, I'm confused. I don't even know what year we were in 2021. It published we're this in year. 2021 now. Yes. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> so last year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, pandemic. Um, <laughs> 2020, I spent all of the summer of 2020 writing uh, this book, which was an interesting time to be writing about this. Um, and it really, the, the goal was just to, to bring awareness to the conversation that needs to be had and to try to get rid of some of those excuses that we hear people talking about um, and just get them doing some pre-work you know, so that by the time I get to them, I don't have to keep repeating myself. Uh, there are concepts that they understand. And, you know, and, and this work, it has to be consistently practiced. So, you know, it's great that you read the book. I want you to read the book. I also want you to watch the course on unconscious bias. I want you to do some learning. It's one of the reasons that um, you mentioned in the introduction, where, where else can they find me? I actually just created the Rework Work community. So if you go to reworkwork.com, um, we are putting resources in there because this is an ongoing thing, right? There's no point listening to this podcast and then going, oh, that was interesting and going back to work. What do you do next, right? Are you going to make a commitment to actually have a conversation with others in your workplace and start to see what kind of a difference that you can make? Are you going to go do some more reading? Are you going to learn? Are you going to start practicing inclusive behavior? Um, and so a lot of these things, we're trying to put a lot of free resources um, into the space. Obviously there will be some paid resources, but just if we can get people thinking, talking uh, and realizing that how you show up, you know, it goes back to your question about whether or not you, you don't think that you intentionally um, excluded people, right? right. But the thing I tell people all the time is we intentionally exclude people all the time. The thing is we don't realize it, right? Because what we're doing is we are intentionally including a certain subset of people. And every time you decide to include one person over somebody else, you have the opposite of that, right? Is that you have decided to exclude that person. But we don't think about it like that. We only think about it like, well, of course I, I took John and David with me to lunch because they're my friends. We've been friends for you know, years. Why wouldn't I take them to lunch? Yeah, but you left Harry behind. Why did you decide to leave Harry? We didn't decide. Yeah, you did, right? You made an intentional choice to only take these two people with you. <laughs> so when we start looking at, again, I keep saying it's about a perspective change. When we start flipping things around and looking at the other side of things, we realize, that yes, our actions have consequences. And that, uh, I just got the email about that today. So I'm on this, the community. So people go to your website to sign up for, for, to be a part of the community. Is that what happens? Yes. I don't know if we have the link up on the, the community just yet. I think we, we put it out to all the people who have been uh, subscribers to our newsletter and have been, so you get first access to it, but uh, it will be up shortly probably in the next couple of days. Okay. And I, I, your approach is very interesting too for, um, you know, on your book writing to get a publisher first because you didn't want to put, if I, if, in between the lines, I think what I heard on the efficiency thing was, I don't want to write a book that a publisher then says, eh, I wish you had written this. Is that what went into your thinking? Definitely. And okay. I'm, I'm always about, it's, it's one of the things about me. I, I don't like wasted energy. So um, 
anytime I can make something quicker, faster, shorter, easier, I will. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons that people like working with, with, with us at, at the Rework Work is because that is what we look at. We look at every company uh, individually and we look at, okay, what have you got going on? And then how can we do this quicker, faster, right. <laughs> make it better? And how do you, on a personal level, how do you maintain and, and grow and replenish your energy? What? I have a good network of friends um, and that network is not that diverse. <laughs> it is one of those things I've been working on, but I mean, I, I take that back. It, it, it ebbs and flows. I think I have a, a pretty good group um, of individuals. I will say most of them are women um, that when I'm really struggling or I need a resource or I'm just like, I just can't do it today. <laughs> They remind me that yes, you can. Yes, you will. Go get it done. Um, so, okay, fair enough. And I, I want to learn a little bit more about the LinkedIn learning that you do because I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, but I, I don't think I've ever done a LinkedIn learning. And I'll bet there's a lot of people who who never have. But you've reached over a million people doing your LinkedIn learning. How did that get get started? What what is it? And how can people do that with you as well. Yes. Um, so I believe the main website is just linkedin.com slash learning. Um, and if you have a pro subscription to LinkedIn, you actually have access to it. Um, and they have a ton. I don't know if any of you ever uh, used to use um, lynda.com. And so LinkedIn bought lynda.com and then expanded on the library. So, and then of course, because Microsoft now owns LinkedIn, um, they've now thrown in, there's so many resources in there. So what I like about the learning platform is um, there's so many things for you to learn in there. You know, it's, it's like a Coursera or a Udemy. Yeah, um, okay. There are a ton of, you know, and especially for, if you look, you're looking to excel in your job, you're looking to uh, grow and enhance your skills, there are so many things that can help with that. So the course, um, I have actually have four courses on the platform. One is um, a course on unconscious bias. And then I have one on how to write a resume. <laughs> and so those are actually my two most uh, top performing courses. Um, and the unconscious bias course is actually the number one most viewed course for uh, all of 2021. Wow, congratulations. Yeah, they just announced that a couple of days ago. So that's really exciting to see that um, for the entire year, it's the number one course, uh, the, the most viewed, which just goes to show that there's a lot of focus on diversity, equity, inclusion right now. So, um, and, and it's, they've offered it for free. That's the other thing they're doing is for the next few weeks, uh, the unconscious bias course is available for free. And it is in different languages. I think it's in, I wanna say Portuguese, Spanish, Mandarin and Japanese. Hmm. LinkedIn. Link, so you go to linkedin.com slash learning and then you just type in your name, Stacy. Yep, Hardy. you can type in my name. Um, you can type in unconscious bias. Um, there are just a ton of resources. I think it's a really great opportunity. And uh, I tell people all the time, like if you have a library card, for many people, it's free because a lot of libraries actually have access to um, to the learning. Oh, if you, okay, good tip. Yeah, huh? And you just this, have to like log in, use your library card. Okay, yeah. And th this course on how to write a resume—that kind of, I, I, I kind of uh, wasn't expecting that. So, how much different is it to write a resume now than before? What are people missing about writing a resume, or how different do resumes need to be to get noticed? Yeah, the, the resume course, um, you know, there's a ton of information in there. Um, and it goes from not just how to write the resume, but also there's aspects of how to get your resume noticed. Um, yeah. And so I think that's probably why it's also been pretty popular is that um, you don't have to watch the whole thing, right? You can just watch the segment. All people send me emails and say, I don't know how to write an objective. Okay, go look at the section on how to write an objective. It will walk you through what to do. Um, and I think that in, especially now, with so many people leaving their jobs and with, um, there's a lot of people who haven't had to look for a job in a long time. 
you know, people had gotten fur furloughed during the pandemic and then eventually let go. Um, it's also the reason that so many people have started businesses uh, because they've just said, you know what, I don't want to go back to work. I'm right. going to do my own thing. So this might be out of left field, but on, on, but on the same resume thing, I, a couple of weeks ago, there was a story in the Wall Street Journal about some of the challenges people are facing with resumes, both the applicants and the, um, the companies, because so many of the resumes now go through these computer bots or, you know, they go through software systems that sort of weed out. Right. Um, and if your resume doesn't hit the exact right points, you get weeded out and you don't even get a, a look like the machine takes you out. It's kind of right. Orwellian even a little bit. What's been your experience with, with that? And how do you, and does that impact the, the DEI uh, work or, or does it impact DEI, you know, progress? I mean, I think it, it does to an extent, right? It's one of the reasons when LinkedIn first rolled out, if you remember that back in like 2004, 2005, um, people of color didn't like to put their, their photo up. Like that was a new thing, like having this, this online system where now you have photos. And it was like, what? All these years we've been told you don't put a photo on a resume. Why would I now go to LinkedIn and put my photo up so people can okay. see me, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, of course, it's, it's weird if you don't have a photo on there. Um, yeah, you're the creeper but, if you don't have a photo. You're <laughs> right. <laughs> and so it, it LinkedIn actually changed that um, that practice. And I think that the the reason that there was a hesitancy for people of color to put their photo up was because they said, well, it's going to be so easy now for me to be discriminated against. And so I always put my photo up because I said, look, I'm black. I'd rather you know up front and reject me out of hand than waste my time. There goes my efficiency again. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I don't want you to waste my time and I show up and then you realize I'm black and you don't hire me. I'd rather you just cut me up front. So I think that there isn't the issue with resumes now because the advice I give people, and this is advice I gave 10 years ago, I still give today. And I think it's even more true today because of these systems is if you're going to apply to a job, you then need to follow it up. Uh, and I get it, you can't do this for every single job because you just don't have enough time. But you need to pick your top five, your top 10 places that you absolutely wanna work and then do everything in your power to find the hiring manager, find the HR person, find a recruiter, find a friend, right? Yeah. And get your resume to that person. Yes, you have to apply online because they require it. But nothing stops you from also, right, in addition to sending your resume to the hiring manager, sending your resume to the recruiter, emailing your resume, mailing it in if you have to, right? Like these are some of the overlooked things that people have forgotten about, they don't do anymore. And I'll, I'll so these two quick stories and then I will move on, right? So one job that I got, and I get it, this was back in the day, but this, I mailed my resume to, uh, to the job right, to the person who would have to hire me, or at least would have to interview me. Um, and that was why I got the job, or at least why I got the interview. I can't say it's why I got the job, but he told me, he, later he said, your resume showed up on my desk in an envelope the same day that somebody put a letter of resignation on my desk. So I had your resume and a letter of resignation. I was one of the first people to be interviewed. Now it didn't guarantee me the job, but at least it guaranteed me an interview, right? Had I only applied online, I wouldn't have, I probably wouldn't have gotten the interview. So sometimes we've got to be creative about how we're going to get uh, get the get eyeballs on the resume. And the second example of that is um, when I first moved out here, I wanted to work at Mattel. And same thing, I had to apply online. So I applied online, didn't hear anything. I called a couple of recruiters, didn't hear anything. And because the industry's uh, law. And um, what's the other one? Financial services. Those are companies that to this day still have fax machines. I know there are people listening to me going, what, fax machine? Yeah, I know. They still have them though. They right. still use them. <laughs> and so I did, I, I dug and I found the fax number to the head of the department of the law firm, not law firm, the, the law department in Mattel. 
and I faxed my resume. And the head of the department got my resume off the fax machine, called down to HR and said, why haven't you interviewed this person? <laughs> because I did apply, right. I was in their system, but their ATS system weeded me out and I couldn't get in front of anybody. And it's only because I faxed it. She got it in her hand and looked at it and she called them and chewed them out. So I can't believe you haven't interviewed this person. <laughs> That is so, thank you for sharing those stories because it's, it's such wonderful advice. One, you know, just because there's a system that you have to go through, electronic system or whatever, doesn't mean that's the only system that there is. So don't tell, don't say, oh, they didn't get back to me, right? If you haven't tried these other avenues. Right. And two, this is very novel. It's gonna, this is very novel. It's very 2021. Are you ready? People don't get mail at work anymore. And when what? they get something addressed to them that gets put on their desk, they're like, what? <laughs> I got to open that up, right? I got to exactly. open that up and see what that is. Yep. Um, FedEx it if you have to. I mean, and yeah. like I said, are you going to do that for every job? Absolutely not. But if you have your top five one you want, jobs, yeah. the place you absolutely want to work for, go for it. So Stacy, last question here. What, what, what are you shooting for? Um, and I, 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 so you've, you've reached a million people on the, with LinkedIn learning. Are, do you have a goal of the number of companies you want to help transform or the number of people's lives that you want to help improve or do, or do, and if you don't, that's fine. I'm just curious how you're measuring yourself. Cause as someone who's, you know, sort of as, straight talk as, as you are and energy efficient and all of those things, I feel like there's probably something there. Yeah, I'm actually working on, um, again, efficiency, right? So I'm working on how can I tap into and help more leaders on a one-to-one -one basis, um, but that will be effective. And so I'm struggling actually with the idea, and I guess we're all struggling with this, right? In person versus online. Yeah. Um, and with, in the training world, it's like asynchronous versus live. And, you know, everyone likes to say, well, asynchronous training doesn't work because somebody can just go online, they can click play, and then they can be doing something else and they're not paying attention. Um, and the thing is that live is expensive, right? Because you can only really uh, tap into so many people at a time. And so it's arduous and it takes longer. It's not so energy like, efficient either. Right. So like somewhere between completely asynchronous and completely live is where I am working on developing content. And so that's what I've actually been doing is I, I've created a series for leaders called the Y of DEI. And it's a mix. It's a hybrid of um, really sort of online learning for leaders, uh, as well as some live sessions that are going to help. Uh, transform transform them. So my goal is to see if I can get uh, a thousand leaders through that training by the end of uh, 2022. So we'll see. How, thousand how, through the end of 2022. Okay, how great goal. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, Stacy, this has been so much fun getting to know you. I do want to thank you for coming on the podcast. Thanks for sharing your stories. Thanks for the work that you're doing and the difference that you're making. Um, I mentioned at the beginning some ways to get in touch with you. Is there another way that you prefer people to connect with you or find out more about what you and your company do or what, what do you want people to do? Easiest way is to go to reworkwork.com or to follow me on my LinkedIn. Okay, perfect. That's how I connected with you was on LinkedIn. So good advice. Well, th thank you so much for being on the show and, uh, and, and yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the How Did Happen podcast, where we believe that success doesn't happen unless you make it happen. You can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you like to listen. And while you're there, please rate it and leave a comment as well. I'd love to hear your thoughts about the show, ideas for future guests, or whatever you'd like to share. And of course, you can always find me at MikeMalatesta.com. See you next time. Thanks again for listening to the How Did Happen podcast.